thank you. Thank you, tech. <laughs> yes, I am Eileen Budd. I am an artist, an author, and first and foremost, probably, I am a storyteller. And I grew up in Perthshire in a family with a really strong tradition in oral storytelling and a really strong belief in maintaining that tradition in oral storytelling. So I grew up listening uh, to lots of different stories, folk stories and legends and myths from Scotland. And I would listen and I would retell the stories. And I would also visit museums as a child. I loved it. And I would see the objects and I'd be like, ah, oh, that reminds me of that story. And that reminds me of that story. And I'd be like, oh, I bet they tell these stories in the museum. I started working in museums about 20 years ago and realized very quickly that that was not the case. Uh, we think about very, objects very much as being an it and we put it to the side and we don't think about the life so much that that object still has. A lot of the objects, for example, in folk museums, they're made of iron, they're for cooking. We could still use them, <laughs> but we don't. We kind of go, that was then, this is now. So, we're excellent at talking about all the tangible side of things, you know, how they are made, why they were made, what the purpose was for them, who used them, when, the dates. But we really drilled down into that. When was it made? Like you were saying, the truth, the truth of the object, the truth, the truth, where's the truth? And sometimes we forget about the intangible stuff the folk stories, the traditional stories around these objects, the cultural importance around them of the time, the superstitions, the beliefs, all these different things about the objects. It's great to hear about the conservation of the materials and things, and we should have it absolutely from the ground up, conservation inbuilt. But these materials that we made, like iron, there's all sorts of folk beliefs about iron, especially in Scottish tradition. We don't really talk about it much. It's just like, oh yeah, it's made of iron, it might rust. <laughs> and there's also all these different techniques that went into to making these objects, these incredible things. And if we start incorporating the intangible heritage with the intangible, then you get a much, much richer picture of what the past was like. And I'm going to switch now to my notes that are on my phone. <laughs> Seamlessly. You wouldn't even have known that I have done it. <laughs> yeah, so by doing so, we can create these opportunities for discussion and engagement with our folk collections. And we can prompt adults and children to start thinking about different things and notice connections between our cultures and other cultures as well, because a lot of our stories have parity with different cultures. You know, there's a story in Scottish tradition, it's a medieval story, and it's about how the mound in North Berwick was formed. Do you know that story? Do you guys know that story? Right, so in the 13th century, we told this story that there was an ogress and she lived underneath North Berwick. And she was really crabbit, like really crabbit. And she would just be thumping around all day. She'd be swearing her head off, I'm not gonna do it. She'd be thumping her big whippy tail across the, across the cave. And she lived right next door to the devil. And the devil was sick of all this noise. And the people in North Berwick were sick of all the noise as well. They were like, oh, we should just shut up. And the devil was like, right, I know how to fix her. And he sent loads of moles, loads of moles at her. And she was ever full of them in her clothes, in her hair, everywhere. And she was raging. If she wasn't raging before, she was, oh just beyond raging. And the devil thought that was hilarious. And he was pure laughing. He was like standing there just greeting, tears streaming with laughter. And she saw him and she swore again, not gonna do it. And she just started chucking the moles at him. Like they were bouncing off him. And he was screaming. He started running away and she starts laughing. She thinks it's hilarious. And she laughs so hard that she does this humongous fart and it blasts all the earth up into the mound of North Berwick. And then she rides off on her pig, right? That's how she gets about. Now, we sort of look at it and it's a comical, it's a comical story, right? But it has parity with an ancient Greek myth of Demeter, 
who rode about on a pig and was sometimes a pig herself. So we've got this like underground ogress goddess. We've got this big physical mound. We've got all these stories that, you know, don't just connect us to the land, but they connect us to other land, connect us to ancient Greece. So I travel all over Scotland, the Travelling Folk Museum, using storytelling, illustration and object handling to bring Scottish stories, generally from working class history and folklore, to life for a whole range of audiences. So I talk to early years children, and if I was telling this story to early years children, I would get used to do the fart noise, right? We were, were a higher brow, I understand that. <laughs> Next time, though. Uh, and then, so I talked to early years, but I talked to like much, much older groups as well, the whole way through. And the objects that we have are a mixture of actual historic objects and replica objects that were made by artists, Scottish artists, who are using the same techniques that were used, you know, like centuries ago. So we're maintaining those traditions, we talk about those traditions, and we talk about the folklore around things, and we talk about how they were made, and they're all handling objects. Because the power of storytelling, which you have both mentioned today, is, is always related to that object, and you learn so much. And that's the special thing about objects and museums. Museums have this opportunity for object-based learning, and that's really special. It's a physical thing. And storytelling attached to that breaks down all these different learning barriers. It's incredible and it's powerful. So, anyway, here is one of the original objects, the skull. Now, this one, this is my stove, by the way, iron. <laughs> the original one is about 30 year old and crumbling to bits. So my friend recently gave me a new one. So. Here he is. Now, this is one of the first stories I ever learned as a child. I must have been about nine when I learned this story. And I'm going to share it with you, right? So, there was a wee boy and he was walking along the roads with his granny. And he saw in a ditch a dead deer. And he goes, oh, gran, dead deer in a ditch. And she goes, well, describe it to me. So he goes, well, it's white. It's deed. It's got antlers. She goes, no, man, really describe it to me. So he gets down into the ditch, sticks his finger, and it's yak, it's I, it's E. And suddenly he can see hills, valleys, mountains. He can hear the birds singing. He can hear the buzzing of bees. He can smell the flowers and he can hear the wind and the leaves and the trees and the grasses shifting. And in the far distance, he can hear a woman's voice and it's saying, come back, come back. And suddenly there he is again, standing in the ditch with his finger in a dead deer. And he sees his granny, because it was his granny's voice that he heard. And he tells her all about it. Oh, you wouldn't believe the things I've seen and heard. And she said, well, now you understand. There's two times. There's now and here. And then there's story time. And you can go between those two any time you want. It's just a matter of looking at things differently. Now that story was the first story I ever learned really, but it's also the most, one of the most important stories that I know because there's a few themes in it. One of them is the Scottish folk tradition idea that time is irrelevant, that you are the river, you are the carrying stream. It is your responsibility to bring the past into the present and then into the future. So that's one idea. It's a very old Scottish traditional belief. And it's echoed all through our language and our stories. 
That's one. Number two. <laughs> it uses an object as an opportunity, an object of movement, of transformation, of transportation. And that's the power of using objects in learning. It's transportational. It could be. So, the story also has parity with some First Nations stories. Um, I'm thinking particularly of Black Elk, who was Lakota Sioux, and he had visions, and he had visions of everything being in the centre, and how time was connected that way. So that's one. But if that's too far out for you, <laughs> because it's, it's early, isn't it? <laughs> then, I'm going to tell you this. Now, here's one of Travelling Folk Museum's original object. Do you know what it is, anybody? I can shout out, like... Well, that's right, it's a cruisy. We call it cruisy. Now, this is one of my favourite objects, because it's really dirty. <laughs> it's quite grubby. It does need conservation. <laughs> I'll give you my card. <laughs> oh, you give me yours. Um, but it's really, it's interesting because I go to schools where, and I say, right, what do you think this is? And the kids get to handle it, they wear gloves. <laughs> and they get to handle it and they get to guess. Now, once I took this to a school and I must have done about like six classes and I gave this object to the kids and I was like, pass it around, you know, have a talk about it. We, we play guessing games, like, is it this, is it that, 20 questions, all that kind of thing. Not one of them got it, six classes, not one of them. Final class of the day, I went in and the teacher said to me, there's a couple of kids in this class who might not interact with you, okay? But don't worry about it. It's, you know, it's not you, okay? I'm like, all right, fair enough. So, pass this object around, the cruisy, pass it around, what is it? All these beautiful guesses, like, <laughs> some of them, the imagination is just amazing. Uh, and then there's this lad at the back, right at the back, and he held it, and he looked at it, and he took his time over it, and then he said, it's a lamp. And I was like, yes! And to the whole class, it was like, yes, he has guessed it. And he's the only person in the whole school to have guessed it. Give him a round of applause. Everyone gave him a round of applause. Teacher told me afterwards that that was the first time in his school career, and this was a P6, he had ever got a question right in class. And he had been made to feel terrible about it his whole school career. And yet, you give him an object, you tell him a story, right through that barrier. That's the power of museum object learning. And so this is one of my favourite objects <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But it also means that we can then go on about... There's folklore related to fire, carrying the fire. There's folklore related to all the things that would have been involved in making the fire. But also, there's whaling. There's stories about whaling. And there's the ethics of that. And then there's the relationship between us and Greenland, because we have parity in our folklore with Greenland. So we can talk about that. And then we can talk about, well, what's the modern equivalent of this? You know? So there's all these things came out of that. And I tell you, in that class, that boy was like, <laughs> couldn't keep him quiet, like, it's great. So, and then there's another, so I'll show you another object. So, I'm gonna go back to that one. <laughs> so this is a Rowanberry necklace. Now, again, there was a wee girl who really got into this, that she would, she'd never taken part in the class before, not interested. I was told specifically she will get up, she will walk around, she'll leave, she'll not interact, that's okay. And I was like, well, that's fine. So I brought this out and that was it. <laughs> it's just locked in, fantastic. Now, Rowan Berries, 
are important in Scottish folk culture and folk tradition because the round berries came out at the end of harvest, it was a signal, but also all these different charms are then made from round berries, so there's ones that protect children, there's ones that protect the house, and there's a beautiful rhyme that you do while you're making one of these things. This one was made by a friend of mine called Kay Reed, which is amazing, and she uses all these traditional techniques. This little bead here is lammer, amber, which also has all these uh, folklore properties and stories about it. But when you're making one of these, then you would say a rhyme uh, goes, black luggy lammer beat, round tree and reed street, put the witches to their speed, round tree and reed street. So we're all protected now for witches. <laughs> so like red, color of blood, Rowan berries, end of the harvest, there's so many things in that. It's really, it's quite a rich source of stories and information. And you can just pick which one you want to go into, really, with it. But generally, a lot of the folk stories around Rowans tend to be about fairies, fairy tradition. And we have these amazing stories where, well, for instance, one, there's a guy called Angus and his mother's Noel. And the only thing that can save her are these magical berries on an island. And this, these magical berries, these magical rowan berries, beautiful tree, is protected by a big dragon who's wrapped around the trunk of this tree. No one can get near it. Anyone who steps foot on that wee island to get those berries, burnt to a cinder, game over. But Angus is desperate. He swims across the lake, loch. It's freezing cold, he gets to the other side, and the dragon wakes up. And the dragon goes, I'm gonna eat you. <laughs> and Angus goes, please don't, let me tell you why. I want them for my mother. She's very sick, they're not for me. So the dragon goes, well, have a word with the fairies, because I'm really your work for them. So he has a wee word with them. And the fairies say, that's fine, you can have the berries. However, you must become protector of the round tree. You must return in a year's time to protect the round tree. So the dragon explains that as best he can to Angus. And Angus goes, fine, fine, fine. Because he's not bothered, right? He just wants the berries. He gives the berries. So <laughs> he gives a lift over the lock, it's freezing. So he gets the berries, he goes home. His mother takes them, she's so much better, she's great now, it's fine, hooray, happy days. And he completely forgets about his promise to the fairies, completely forgets about it. Until a year later, he's doing something else, doing something. And he finds his whole body just starting to move on its own. And he's forced towards the door, can't stop it. And he's forced down the road and he's forced over the hills, forced over the dales, like a puppet. And then he finds himself standing beside the rowan tree again. And he, he looks around, but he can't see the dragon. And then suddenly he feels his body twist, break. And his arms and hands become scaly and clawed. And a huge great tail sprouts from his back and wraps itself around the round tree. And as he sinks his great big head into the ground, his head heavy, feeling like the roots of the tree itself, he looks across and he sees a very old man slipping into the water of the loch. He says, thank you. There's all sorts of stories <laughs> about our objects. But the fairies particularly are good ones. And the thing about fairies in Scottish folk tradition and folklore is that they are associated generally with mounds and the dead, burial cairns. Now, one of the most fun objects that I have well, even though it's got quite a grim <laughs> association, is a replica object, a miniature version of a beaker folk burial beaker. 
And these are great. This one is very small. Again, it was made by a friend of mine, Fox. She does beautiful work. She works with wild clay. She fires it. So this was made using traditional techniques that have been in this country for millennia. And she used the patterns are based on Caithness, one that was found in Caithness. Now, these are brilliant handling objects. The feel of it is great. It feels really human. And you can get the kids to make replicas of them, which is also great. So you're also making and you're doing and you're learning all at the same time. The other thing about it is you can talk about the fact that these were buried with people. Why would that be? Why would that be interesting? Why would that be a thing? Well, why would you do that? There's a belief there. There's a belief in the afterlife, in some kind of resurrection, in some kind of transformation, you know. Some of the burials, they've got food with them, they've got flowers with them, they've got things to comfort them, they've got things that they were using or living with at the time. So you can get all sorts of stories about that. You can go down so many different rabbit holes about that. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's an example of ritual, and we can talk about modern rituals. What's the parity there? Where's the comparison? It's good fun. So that's one. And then if we're talking about fairies, then here's one. And this is completely, this is a completely mythical object. All right. This is called a fae finder, or finding fairies. This was made by a friend of mine, a blacksmith. And it's got all sorts of little hexafoils for guarding against witches and fairies. And it's made from iron, but it's made to look like gold. Because in Scottish folklore, fairies don't like iron. They do like gold, so you're sort of bringing them out and repelling them at the same time. Some trickery going on. This is a great object for early years because you can get children who maybe don't want to sit still, they maybe want to move around. You can get them to look through it, you can get them to find, like, oh, check out, make sure there's no fairies in the room because they're evil. And they go, ah. Oh. <laughs> and they always see one, there's always one. <laughs> but these make yeah, it just makes a fantastic object to start talking about things and start talking about different things, like how do we see things? Where is our perspective of things, you know? In actual Scottish folk tradition, you probably wouldn't use one of these. You'd probably use like a hold stone or um, a sheep's shoulder blade. But then, you, you know, I've got one of them as well. We can talk about that, talk about divination, talk about use of ordinary everyday objects for mythical, magical things. Because it does tend to be like a wecht. This is this big sieve that we'd use for sieving out corn and meal and stuff. On quarter days and festivals and high holidays and stuff, it was used for divination. You know, you'd put smoke through it, put smoke through it, see what you can see. But it's just otherwise, every other day, it's just a sieve. Same as with these, a rattle made of willow. Now in that, there's seven quartz stones, which is a baby's rattle, handmade. And those seven quartz stones are supposed to represent sins and evils. Shaking them, you're banishing them, or the baby is banishing them. Again, you can have conversations about, what do we use these days? We try and drive things away. You can talk about medicine, you can talk about beliefs, all sorts of things. And there are loads of stories, some very, very dark and some very, very fun and more Victorian, that you can tell with the children and tell with adults, talking about, you know, what do we use for protection these days? What do we use for security? How do we think about evils? What, you know, all this kind of thing. It's good fun. <laughs> One of the things I'm doing at the moment, current projects, is I'm working with different folk museums. One of them is Glenesque Folk Museum. They've got 3,000 objects. And then working with them to interpret some of those objects, talking about not just the history of the community that those objects came from directly. And sometimes we even know the exact name and location of the person who had them. One of them is this big wheel, this big spinning wheel. Now this lady lived in Wigginton, 
in Glen Esk. And that's a village that no longer exists. There's about 75 villages in Glen Esk that no longer exist. And there's history there about clearances, about deer parks, about sheep, about industrialization, people moving from rural into the city, all sorts of things. And this lady was a visitor attraction. And people would come from all over the world and learn folk traditions from her. And they would learn how to spin, and they would learn how to weave, and they would learn how to cook bannocks, all that kind of stuff. And they would sign her visitor's book, which is how we know that that's what happened and where they came from. Because we love the written record. <laughs> but as well as that, there's loads of songs and folk songs. So, so we're just kind of getting into that right now. And so because I grew up in this idea that, you know, it's not just the written record that's important. It's not just the things that we know for certain. It's not just the truth. Let's get down to the truth. Let's get to the truth. It's also the overarching myths, the beliefs, the superstitions, the other things that go along with it. The things that make our culture rich and unique or things that make our culture rich and connect to other cultures. And I don't know any other way that is more human like to connect with other cultures than to tell stories, to share stories. Here I am in the field recording these ladies who grew up in Glen Esk and they had so many stories about the schools, about folklore, about, you know, gossip, lots of old gossip. <laughs> it's brilliant, it was so good. And we could add these oral traditions, these oral stories, to the objects directly. Go, oh, right, this was owned by Betty down the road. She was a bit of a goer. <laughs> it's good. And so that's it, really. That's my point. Is that, you know, it's not just it's not just the written word, it's not just the beautiful truth and the absolute faith that we have that what we're saying is yes or no, or black and white, or maybe you're not. It's all these other things that make it all up. And we should definitely make sure, make room for the oral history and the oral traditions in our collections. <laughs>